Okay, so we're going to continue today um, with the world of graphic design, but we'll speak more, more specifically about actually doing layouts and setting things up so that you can create good quality graphic design pieces, uh, obviously building on the things that we talked about in the last two lectures. But today is more about structure and organization and how do you present the content to somebody such that it's clear and easy to understand. So we'll start fundamentally with a grid system. And then we'll break down and we'll get into alternative grids and kind of show how those things can evolve. But I think if we have a good understanding of basic grid systems, generally speaking, it's kind of like rule of thirds. When in doubt, if you follow a grid system, it's going to be better. When in doubt, if you do the rule of thirds, it's going to be better. So we're going to go through those basics. And in order to talk about grid systems, I want to talk about the parts that make up a grid system, which is really the parts that make up a good graphic design piece. And we'll start first with something called a margin. And this should be very obvious to you. You've worked with margins before. You type your English paper, it has margins around the outside. You type your history paper, it has margins around, uh, around the outside. Essentially, what it's doing is it's defining the active area of the page versus the non-active area of the page. And if, we, if we imagine for a second that we had a page that had no margins, and the text started right on the left and went all the way across to the right, it would be kind of awkward. There'd be no place to hold it. There'd be just a, a, a body of text. So we have this margin that gives us space around the work itself to breathe. And it also gives us something to hold on to if we're holding the piece of paper, et cetera. It's going to direct the viewer toward the visual elements. So it's space around to direct you toward something in the center. They can vary in size depending on the format. They can be small. They can be big. But there's generally always some kind of a border or a margin. Sometimes they contain other elements. So you might, in your English paper, have footnotes. Or in your uh, history paper, you might have footnotes. Those can go in the margin, but they're generally smaller, and they don't take up all of the margin. Um, but they can be in that space. So in this example, I'll keep showing this one over and over again. And it's a little light. I apologize. The margins are highlighted in that light blue color. Then we move into columns. And again, pretty obvious. If you've read a newspaper, if you've read a magazine, you're familiar with what a column is. It's essentially a vertical division of space used to align the visual and text elements on a particular page. They might divide the page up into multiple columns. So you might have three or four columns, depending on the, the content that you're making. And the widths vary according to the function of the design. So how long is the line length? If you're typing that history paper, I keep coming back to the English paper or the history paper, essentially that's usually just one column of text from one side to the other with a certain line length that's comfortable to read. If we get into like a magazine, they might have four columns, much smaller, shorter little pieces, and you read through rather quickly. Different function. So in this context, there's our columns right there. And in, in this example page, there's four actual columns. Then we move into something called a column interval, or a gutter width. And this is essentially the space between the columns. And you have to have this space to identify what the columns are. Otherwise, the columns just run together. Not quite so critical if you had photographs that were in, laid out in columns. But it, certainly in text, if you had one column of text and you had no space into the next column of text, it would be really hard to distinguish where one column ended and the other column began. So we put this thing called a column interval in between the columns. It gives us a little bit of space between the columns, let those columns breathe as part of this uh, graphic design piece. It's an inactive negative space. So it's generally just the color of the background. Nothing's happening in there. We don't need special lines or, or little designations. It's just a little bit of blank space. And it prevents the elements from colliding together on the page. So here's our example here, where they're falling in between those four columns. Then we get something called a flow line. And so the first three things that I talked about, the margins, the columns, and the column intervals, you probably are familiar with. This next one, called a flow line, you've seen before, but you probably didn't know what it was called. And you probably hadn't really internalized what it does. Essentially, you've got a, a set of vertical columns. And we can run a horizontal, a contrasting line across those vertical columns in a specific place. And that divides up the content of the page. So in this particular example here, you see that we have the columns and we have the photographs. But we have that one strong horizontal line that runs across the page. That is a flow line. And it's generally that line that's consistent throughout your work that helps you organize your information. 
So there it is right there as a flow line. We can change where that flow line goes. So in this particular example, I have it shown the primary one is running right across there. But it could happen halfway down. It could happen almost to the bottom. Next lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about portfolios and portfolio design layout. And you'll see that this flow line appears frequently in portfolios. And it doesn't always stay in the same place. It jumps around. But it's usually proportional. So we'll talk through what that means uh, next class. But a flow line really, really helps in this overall um, layout. We move into something called a grid module. This is essentially we're taking spatial areas, and they support the visual and, and, um, and textual information. The number of modules vary, but it's pretty obvious. Essentially, we have columns, we have column intervals, we have flow lines. If we look at the squares that those, that grid makes, that's essentially a grid module. So I, I can't highlight all of them here, because obviously then it would look like columns. But this there is a grid module. This would be a grid module. This would be a grid module. Every one of these little squares is a grid module. Okay, So it's, the, it's defined by the column the flow line and the column interval that gives us our active space right there, or our grid module. So here it is in a, in a layout piece itself, where you can actually see the individual grid modules rel relatively easily. Okay, We have a flow line. Actually, we have two flow lines. There's one that runs across there. There's one that runs across there. We also have our columns, one, two, three, four, Five, six. Sorry, my five is terrible there. Okay. Notice though that the text is actually spanning two columns. So just because we have this module layout where we have these individual pieces doesn't mean we can't choose to break it. We could actually choose to have a photograph that's that spanned all four of those, for example. So you can always combine them together to create bigger content. Oops, skipped a slide. Sorry about that. So working with basic grids. Essentially, if you have a grid that underlies whatever graphic design piece you're doing, and this really translates to most design in general. If you were talking about architectural design, it would be similar. It unifies and orders the compositional space. It gives you some backbone to work from. And this can help a lot, rather than just doing something arbitrary, because there's an underlying structure that guides where you place certain elements. And when we look at a, a, a portfolio, for example, if there's an, an established structure, it's pretty easy to know what's coming and where to look for certain things. You know where to look for the title. You know where to look for the content. It becomes rather obvious. It composes visual elements to balance and contrast the shape of the page. Don't just arbitrarily throw a grid down on the page. Okay, I'm talking about grids, obviously. Easy to say, oh, we'll just divide that page up into four pieces. Great, we've got a grid. Think about what that grid means and how big your elements are. What's appropriate for your work? How big should that grid be? How many columns should there be? That's going to vary depending on what work you're doing, whether it's a portfolio, what the orientation of the page. Is it landscape? Is it portrait? All of those things factor in. It's not arbitrary. It's something that's thought, carefully thought out and designed on purpose. Functions of grid, you guys could, again, come up with these if I asked you to come up with them. Control, organization, rhythm, harmony, unity, readability, all of these sorts of things are rather obvious. They give you this backbone for your work. So let's start with the most simple grid. It's just a single column grid. This is your history paper. One big block of text, one big image, something like that. If you're writing an 80-page thesis, or maybe an 80-page thesis is a little generous, a 10-page thesis paper, big block of text, this is appropriate. Space is defined by the margins, not by the columns or the col column intervals. It's just the margins around the outside of the page. How big are those margins? It's generally speaking, the margins need a little bit of adjustment or a little bit of tweaking, too. You want to think about, is your text going to end up in a book format? Or is it going to end up just in a single page format? If it's going to end up in a book format, there is a specific way of setting up the margins. Generally, the sides and the bottom are larger. The top is smaller. The inner margin is typically half the width of the outer margin. And if the pages are facing, i.e., two sides of the, the book when you open it, the margins are reversed left to right on each page. 
So here's the larger section that we were talking about here. And I'll walk through that. Right? Space at the top there is generally a little bit smaller than the space at the bottom. That's a little bit bigger. Space on the outside is bigger than the space on the inside. Recognize that this you would turn the page this way. So they are facing pages in this particular example. So how do we lay this sort of thing out? And I'm going to go through this example um, in InDesign. I'll talk you through laying it out and kind of using this as a backbone for your work. But essentially, this is a way of laying out your work, figuring out what the active content area should be, what the margins should be, what they should look like, and then how do you lay out the content based on that. And so I'll walk you through this exact process along the way. So I've talked all about this graphic layout and all that sort of thing. Don't forget the photography section compositional techniques. So just because I haven't specifically said rule of thirds much doesn't mean that that still doesn't really apply nicely to a graphic design. So you can still use that in a graphic design piece. So those, remember those, strong diagonals, all those compositional techniques still work in graphic design just like they do in uh, photography. Then we move into a multiple column grid. Obviously, the more columns you have, the more flow lines you have, the more flexible your design becomes, the more complicated it becomes. You get a lot of compositional options, and it can be suitable for complex projects with lots of content. How do you create movement, drama, rhythm, or tension, get people interested in the particular piece that you're looking for? So you guys all have to do a lecture series poster as part of your assignment for this section or this module of the class. So I figured it was useful to show you a bunch of lecture series posters as a way of kind of talking through lecture series. So as we go through this, you'll see, right, we talk through the text. There's a picture of a poster. Generally speaking, after that, I'll blow up the poster, and then I'll actually draw on it and talk about what's happening in this particular example. So if we were looking at this, how many columns are here? Four? Did you say four? Four. I agree. There's four columns. So we've got the first column right there. There's one, two, three, and four. This space over here doesn't have any content in it, so I'm saying it's a margin, not a column. Okay. So our first column right here contains the big piece of information about what's happening. This is a lecture series, et cetera. Notice we have a really strong flow line that runs right across there. That flow line happens to be about 1 third of the way up the page. This happens to be about 2 thirds. Remember that thing about rule of thirds? Shocking. Right? When you look at a good poster, this kind of stuff starts to happen naturally. So let's move forward and continue. Oops. Modular grids, extensions of multiple column grids with the addition of horizontal flow lines. We already saw this image. We already kind of talked through this. It's important to know that you can add these modules together to create larger pieces. So just be because you have a column doesn't mean you can't span the two columns with a particular image. Determining a module size. So first off, you want to think about what is the ideal length of a line of text? if I'm going to be reading a piece of text. So for example, let's say I had a 12 point font. So this is what, you know, or 11 point, something like this. And I started a sentence right here on the board. And I wrote that sentence all the way along here in one line to the end over here. If I wanted to actually read that sentence, I would start at one end and I'd have to physically move all the way to the end. So this is obviously an extreme example. But at that size, at that distance, it would take me too long. The module is too big. Does that make sense? So we shrink that up, and it becomes easier to read. If I take that same 12-point font and I make it small over here, it's much easier to read now. And I can go through line by line. So you want to think about what is the ideal width for a length of text such that you can read it. The other thing you want to think about is what is the smallest size of a photograph that you want to show. So if you make the module too small, and you put a bunch of little photographs on there, you're not going to actually see anything in the photos. I actually did one of my initial portfolio designs, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, next class when we talk about portfolios. One of my initial portfolio designs for grad school had a bunch of little tiny grid modules. And I was like, oh, this is going to be really cool. I have all these little pictures. Then I printed it out, and I looked at it, and you couldn't see any one of the pictures. It was basically useless. So you have to think about what is that smallest size that would work for your particular content. You can, of course, 
Let's say they don't agree. Let's say the text needs to be a little bit longer than the smallest photograph you want to see. You could span two modules with text so that the line length is correct. So they can be a little bit independent. Let's look a little bit at some example layouts here, just in terms of how they're set up. Large images, medium images, and small images, all very well set up. The text moves around a little bit in these different examples. There is one here that I think is awful, and it's right down there. And it just has to do with the fact that the column, there's three here, and there's two above with the, with the flow line across. It just doesn't quite work. So I like to at least point that out. But generally speaking, the rest of these work rather nicely. Modular grids increase compositional flexibility, no surprise. Grid modules need to be flexible enough to accommodate changing content. So this is a big one. You guys are designing a portfolio as your final for this class. 30% of your grade. It's important. You have to put in there your best photograph. Okay, That was maybe 8 by 8, maybe 8.5 by 11, some size in that ballpark. Then you move on, and you had to do your, your um, other photograph, your, your Photoshop collage example, which might be kind of a similar photographic size. Then suddenly I'm giving you an 11 by 17 poster. Well, that's a different format altogether. That has to go in your book. Then suddenly, I'm going to give you a Charlie Harper image, or uh, you know, and I don't know what all the rest of the assignments are going to be officially just yet. But I start giving you this different content. The sizes are different. You're going to do a 24 by 36 AutoCAD drawing in this class. That's totally different than anything else you've created. So when you get to creating your portfolio, you have to think about how can I put all of this, all of these weird size pieces together. You need this grid module to make that flexibility and to be able to include that information. Alternative grids, so we've talked a lot about strict rigid grids and how they work. Alternative grids are generally more loose and organic. They rely heavily on intuition. This looks right or it doesn't look right. This feels right, it doesn't feel right. There's not a scripted way for me to say, this is how you set up an alternative grid, because it is essentially an alternative grid. They evolve from the basic grids. So generally, if you set up the basic grids, that's a good place to start. But then it might evolve from there. And I'll talk to you about how do you kind of create this content a little bit later on. But alternative grids can look something like this. You're using the visual elements to define the page itself. So each of those elements becomes critical. The compositional structure is often based on a dominant vis visual element or focal point. So let's look at this poster a little bit larger here. How many columns does this poster have? I don't know. It doesn't really have columns, right? So this is definitely an alternative grid. We have kind of a strong diagonal as part of it. We have kind of a strong diagonal in this yellow section. If I can draw, come on. There we go. Strong diagonal here. We have a little bit of a strong diagonal kind of happening there. This shift there is a little bit in that direction. So there's not really a logic to it. It is an alternative grid. Yet, if we stand back and we look at it, there's a clear focal point. You look at the big words first, design, architecture, art, and planning. Then you work your way in a little bit more, and you might see that, oh, this is an exhibition fashion show. And then you might get a little bit more in, and you might start to see additional details. So they're using the elements to compose the page. It, we're not using a grid system at all in something like this. So there's nothing wrong with this. But this kind of a layout is significantly harder to do because it relies so heavily on your intuition and what feels right and what looks right. Another example here of alternative grids. This one has a lot of text in it. Recognize that if you change, if you do text like this upper one, I don't know if I have a larger version of this, no. All right, so this block of text right there, that triangle, it's really awkward up here at the start. Because the line lengths, it's like one word per line. And then by the time you get down here, the line length is pretty long. So as you read through that, it can be a little bit awkward. So you have to be careful of that line length and how much it gets. But at the same time, something like this, with that image, with the text wrapping around it here and there, is kind of unique, kind of nice, well laid out. This has a lot of very strong diagonals as part of the page. Likewise, this has a lot of very strong diagonals as part of the page. So they're relying in this setup on those strong diagonals as the compositional technique. 
So if we spend a lot of time really diagnosing this page, we might see some similarity in how the diagonals are laid out and the angles of the diagonals. So there is consistency. It's just not a normal grid. Breaking the grid. So the same thing happens in the world of architecture as it does in the world of graphic design. And that is that a grid is great as a base for your layout. But then you have to selectively and intuitively decide where it should be broken and why it should be broken. So sometimes you're laying out a grid of columns in architecture and you suddenly remove one column. When you remove that one column, you create a different space than the rest of the space. The same thing happens here as you set up a grid. You remove one grid element, or you span one grid element, or you change it, that becomes a dominant focal point as part of this overall layout. If you break the grid too often, though, the grid's not right for whatever you're trying to do. So it's selective. One here, one there, and that creates a focal point. So let's talk about the interaction of the visual elements. So we've talked about the layout, but how do we interact with those visual elements? First thing is hierarchy development. So how do you develop a system of elements that work in multiple levels or at multiple scales? You establish a clear focal point that drags you in to look at your particular piece of text. And we'll use a bunch of examples as we go forward. Then we take subordinate elements, smaller elements, things that aren't quite as important, and we blend those in. So we have big focal point, smaller medium points, then we get into the final details. If we get into the final details and we've led somebody through this series, chances are they've actually read the content that you're trying to present to them, and they might do what you want them to do. You might get the desired outcome out of it. If a hierarchy is not established, your eye gets overloaded and you move on. It's too easy to glance at something, oh, that's too hard, let me look at something easier. So if we have this clear layout, you'll see one focal element. You move in a little bit closer, and you'll see the next focal element, and you continue going. So let's look at this particular poster, a little bit larger here. What stands out to you in this? I would say National Portfolio Day is the big thing that stands out. Okay, The image, of course. So, so if we were looking at this particular image, if I was in the back of the room, I might see the image. That color might get me excited. I might come in a little bit. I see National Portfolio Day. Ah, OK. I know what's going on. Let me move in a little bit closer. Oh, it's at California College of the Arts. And it's Saturday, January 19th, 2008. OK, sounds pretty good. Then I move in a little bit closer, and I start to see other elements that are smaller. So I'm setting up that hierarchy. I'm setting up that viewing experience purposely. So this is the rule I like to talk about. Because I think it's the obvious one. 12, 6, 3, 1. If you think about multiple scales and you establish a hierarchy in these multiple scales, it's going to be really easy to draw people into viewing your poster. Okay, so in this example, if I walk into the back of the room, and I'm saying 12 feet, but it could be 24 feet, it could be 36 feet, it could be 48 feet, whatever. The point is that if I'm in the back of the room here and I look at this poster, I think I can blow it up to the next size here. Yeah, there you go. If I'm in the back of the room and I look at this poster, obviously there's some color and that grabs some attention. But the first thing I see is National Portfolio Day. It's really obvious. So that's not me, that might be my 12 feet. Then I move forward a little bit. And as I move forward, I start to see progressive levels of detail. Oh, OK, it's Saturday, January 15, 2005. All right, there's the address. Then I move forward a little bit closer. Right? The best design causes you to be engaged at every level as you get closer and closer and closer to the actual piece. So there should be something that causes you to get up close to that final design and want to read the little details. So you actually get up to the door and you read the small print. And if you drag somebody through that experience, they've actually read the content that you want them to read. And they're pretty likely to do whatever it is that you want them to do, because you've engaged them. And you've engaged them on multiple scales. So you as a designer have to think through that. And this works even, OK, we're talking graphic design, but let's say you're doing an architectural presentation. Or let's say you're, you're at Autodesk and you're presenting those speakers. Okay? If your poster has these levels in it, 
and you're doing your presentation, somebody standing in the back of the room will start to get excited about it and they'll want to move closer. And as they start to move closer, they'll get more interested. And if there's something at the next level, they'll move even closer and they'll get more interested. And then there's something at the next level and they keep engaging. And if you can get that engagement, if you can bring those people in, that's what you want in the design field. You want those people interested in what it is you're trying to show them. So if you're going to establish a hierarchy, think first about what are these visual elements and rank them. What's most important? What do I want people to see first? What needs to be the most obvious? That should be the biggest. So if we were doing the lecture series poster, the most important thing is probably it's a lecture series. Next most important thing might be who's coming to speak. Next most important thing might be when they're coming to speak. Next most important thing might be where they're coming to speak. You get the idea. So we're working through and we're ranking that hierarchy. Subordinate elements will occupy the middle ground and obviously smaller elements will be in the background. You could come up with the same list here. Notice though that I do include on here typography. I didn't waste all of last class talking about type to ignore it from here on out. Does that make sense? So no mistakes in typography. That's, that has to be right. Space. This is not outer space. This is space in general. Provides visual contrast to the actual elements of the page. It contributes to an effective ordering system. The empty space, or the space around the elements, brings the elements alive. If you have no space around them, or you haven't considered the space around them, your actual elements, your visual elements, are going to be dead. Focus on the negative space as much as you focus on the positive space. Some of you guys have probably been in, uh, I think it's in 131 that they talk about. It's, that's the freehand drawing studio, right? And so they probably talk a lot about composition, negative space, positive space, that sort of thing. You're doing the same thing here. You want to think about that inactive space as much as you see, think about the active space, and it's going to make your work better. It's absolutely imperative for accessibility and navigation of the page to have this negative space there. It directs the eye toward the visual elements. If you don't have the empty space, you don't get directed toward the full space. So something like this, masterpieces, the masterworks here, it's really kind of interesting the way that this page is laid out. The dominant element is really this bar. Sorry, I should be drawing here, not pointing. It's that empty space. It's right in the center. That empty space draws you in, and then you start to figure out, oh, wait a minute. right? It's masterpieces, but it's kind of cut off here, and that goes back up there, and there's all this other stuff going on. It starts to get interesting. But it's really that negative space that defines that. If we just slammed all of this together, you wouldn't be drawn to that same location. And you wouldn't know where to start. Oops, sorry. Using space, group elements together to provide a focal point. This works nicely with all the photographic compositional techniques that we talked about earlier. Centering an object equalizes the space around it and negates the space around it. Makes it not so exciting. Placing something off center creates that asymmetrical weighted composition generally is more interesting. You don't need to have too much space either. So for example, next page I have just a blank piece of paper up here. And so if I was laying something out on this page and I said, oh, this is great, let me go ahead and just put a little photo. Oops. I'll put a little photo right there. All right, this edge of the page is over here, by the way. I centered that little tiny element. Nothing special about it. If instead, I put the element over here, it feels a little different. Notice, though, that I naturally said this is 1 third, 2 thirds. Same thing. Even that's a little bit small, though. Feels a whole lot better if I start to make something like this. Right? And maybe there's a combination. Maybe I start to add something here, and I put a little bit of text in here. I'm starting to feel a lot better as a layout. I'm using this space to my advantage. My elements are not too small. They're big enough, and they're asymmetrical. They're not centered on the page. 
Scale can also be used to establish elements. You make something bigger, generally more important. You make something smaller, it's not so important. Use consistency and progression when changing. So if, for example, we're doing the lecture series poster, and you have something that says, you know, DVC lecture series, and that's the big text. And then you move into who's coming to speak. And I don't know, Renzo Piano's coming to speak, and Tadao Ando's coming to speak, and uh, I don't know, Rick Joy's coming to speak. Okay, if you make Rick Joy's name bigger than the other two people, does that work? Probably not. Because you want each of those people to be emphasized the same amount, because it's a lecture series. You're coming to the series of lectures, not the one lecture. So you want to make sure that there's consistency in how big that element is, or how big that name is. Quantity. If you have too many things on the page, you get a page that's too cluttered with too much stuff. There's a lack of order. You want to make sure that every piece that is on the page has a specific function and does something specific. And there's two ways to do this. And some people work well in one direction, and some people work well in the other direction. Okay? So one way of doing it is to go ahead and throw everything that you have on the page and say, oh, that's too much, and take something away. Say, oh, that's a little bit better. Let me take something else away. No, that's a little bit better still. Let me take one more thing away. Perfect. I like it. The other way of doing that is the additive method. Put one thing on the page. Mm, not quite enough. And put one more thing on the page. Well, that's getting there. Put one more thing on the page. OK, that's pretty good. So you're adding versus subtracting. And it's going to depend on who you are as a designer, whether you like to throw it all on the page first and see what, it, what happens or whether you want to put one thing on at a time. It just depends on you as a designer. There's nothing wrong. There's no right or wrong answer as to which, which method you use. Orientation and position. So how you orient your stuff is really important. And where you provide contrast is really important. So if all of your elements are horizontal and you throw in one vertical element, suddenly you get a focal point and you get a contrast point. Don't forget about the diagonals. Diagonals can work nicely here as well. So let's look at this Im image, for example. Okay. All the text is horizontal. Even the image is fairly horizontal with the eyes and that sort of thing. And then we introduce a really strong vertical element here. And that happens to be where the text flips backwards. Right? All the rest of this text is all reading correctly. This is the one that's backwards. And it flips along that contrasting line. Depth, dimension, and perspective is also a way of doing this. This is essentially composing in three dimensions. So you have things stacked behind other things. And as you overlap those, you start with what's most important in the front. And the further back they go in perspective, the less important they are. And you stack up your elements that way. It can work. It goes away from the flat two-dimensional presentation. It's more three-dimensional. It's also a little bit harder to do. Layering the elements also can create depth, even in a flat um, layout. Typography. Remember, I spent a whole day lecturing on typography last class. Guess what? It's still important. Can't forget it. Um, it's as important or more important than the photographs and everything else that's on the page. So you have to use those, those particular pieces to help you identify what's happening, to show what's happening, and ultimately to, to label um, and give those visual elements. Think macro and micro scales. Remember we talked about space in between letters and also what the whole block or the whole paragraph looks like. So we look at both scales at once. Color is also important. It can provide a spark of visual interest. One little bit of color can, can draw your eye into something uh, specific. You can use a whole color palette, or you can just use one color. Now, there's one slide today about color. I will spend, I think it's, uh, I think it's lecture 117-ish. I spend the whole day talking about color. That's all we talk about. So today is, is, a, is a short day. It's one slide of color. We'll, we'll emphasize what colors mean and, and that sort of thing a little bit later on. But the introduction of a single color or multiple colors can really push a design forward. So it's up to you to think about what, what is one of those elements, and can I use color to my advantage? One of the things that we did in grad school when we did our final thesis presentations is we all actually picked one highlight color. 
In my case, it was red, but different people picked different colors. And we made sure that every drawing we created, and again, most of these were black and white drawings, had one little bit of red in it. And by just putting that one little bit of color, or in my case, red, it immediately draws your attention to that one area. And you can then spiral out in the composition from there. So a little bit of color can make a really big difference. You can also add in graphic shapes and linear elements, lines, little symbols, and that sort of thing. One of the, the challenges for you guys with this is the tendency is always to add lots of these things. And you'll see this on the first round of portfolios when you guys start in your portfolios. You guys end up creating, oh, I've got a portfolio layout page. Here's my layout page. OK, I've got a little bit of text. Let me put a line under it. And then I'm going to put another line here, and I'm going to cross them, a couple more over there, maybe one over here, and another one over there. And let me put the page number here. And all of a sudden, there's all these lines everywhere. It's too much. So you want to make sure you think about where and why are you using these visual elements. If there's a little plus sign or a little line, it can be great. You just want to carefully consider how much is too much. So in review, you as the designer need to create the hierarchy. You need to be able to show that hierarchy in your design. You have to order and control the design from start to finish. You need to use contrast to establish a focal area, something that changes, something that draws your eye to a specific thing. And then you're going to use the compositional factors to support the overall design. So here's an example. I moved away from the, the lecture series uh, por uh, posters. This is more of a portfolio. But kind of seeing how all of this comes together in a book form. So in this case, we have four columns. The columns are reflected, and they're pretty obvious on the first page. On the second page, though, the columns actually are only identified by the little bits of text that run vertically. So there's little bits of text that identify those four columns. As we move on to the next page in this group, oops, we have a nice strong flow line at the top. We have one big block of text, and we're using those as we go forward. Flow lines are consistent page to page, so notice for example, right, that there, when we move on to the next page, it's in the same place. <coughs> Sorry, keep clicking too many slides, as that line right there. So there's consistency page to page. The flow lines are in the same place page to page. OK, so we're going to shift. I'm going to jump over, and we're going to walk through some more complicated layout structures in InDesign. So give me a second to switch over, and we'll continue with InDesign. Op go ahead and open up InDesign um, while you're waiting for me to switch over. OK, so today you're going to kind of do a precursor round to your lecture series poster. And we're going to do an architecture program postcard. By postcard, I mean smaller than 11 by 17. So 4 by 6, 5 by 7, something along that uh, in terms of size. We're going to think a lot about our graphic layout. And I'm going to walk you through some, some layout techniques and some layout strategies, um, just so that you can see some, some of those strategies come to fruition. And then we'll also talk about alternative grids and, and shapes that aren't rectangles and that sort of thing uh, as we go forward. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new document. So I'll click on New Document. And I want this to be a, a postcard size. So maybe I'll do 5 inches by 7 inches. Remember that if you type in the number, so in this case 5 followed by IN, it's going to automatically convert over to the PICAS units. I'm also going to set the margins at 0, because I'm not going to worry about those just yet. Uh, I'm going to uncheck the box for facing pages. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And that gives me this basic layout. Now, of course, you could do it in uh, landscape mode instead of in, in portrait mode. It's really up to you um, as you go forward. So at this point, I need to start thinking about how I'm going to lay out my particular graphic piece. And so depending on what you're setting up, you can do it using guides. You can do it using some lines and some background information. I'm going to walk you through a couple examples. I will end up today using multiple pages so that you can see me do it different ways. 
Um, but I do want to make sure that my units are sent to inches so that I can see. So I right click where the two rulers meet and I change my units to inches. And so in this case, I have five by seven. And um, if I wanted to just start creating a line arbitrarily, right, I go down and think about the rule of thirds. Let's go down about, I don't know, two and three eighths or so. There's one. two and three. And I do that by dragging these little guides down. And likewise, I could divide this one up. Um, like that. And I could start to use these to establish a basic function. So for example, maybe my content is going to end up being in this lower section there. Oops, sorry. And then maybe, let me go ahead and place something in here so that you guys can see it. Fitting, fill frame proportionally. And then maybe I'll put some text elements in. and arrange this. Remember we talked about type before, so I can switch over to typography. And then we can start to change. We'll make the justification to the right, <laughs> etc. I can start to lay it out that way. Sometimes this is a little bit too arbitrary in setting it up. So I'm going to show you another strategy for working through this. So in this case, instead of doing the basic guides, which I will create some basic guides, I'm going to create a few diagonal lines to help me set this stuff up. And in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and use the layers, which we haven't used yet. And I want to kind of introduce that as a concept. If I click, and I'm in typography right now, I can go back to advanced. And I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to choose the layers window right here, or the layers panel. And as I look at the layers panel, I have layer one <coughs> as my only layer. I want to go ahead and I want to create a second layer. So I'm going to come down to the bottom of this panel and click on the new layer button. And when I do that, I get layer two. And so let me use layer two, and I'm going to rename it to be guides. And notice that when I double click on the layer to rename it, obviously I can change the name. But I can also uncheck the box for print layer. So if I uncheck the box for print layer, when I go to do an export or I go to print my drawing, things that are on this layer won't show up. So it's like an invisible layer which is really useful. So I want to make sure I uncheck that, because I'm going to put my guides on <laughs> this layer. And I'll go ahead and say OK. So it's called guides. Notice also that the text changes to be italicized when it's a non-printing layer. So it's really easy to see, oh, that's not something. Anything that's on this layer isn't going to show up. So making sure that that layer is selected blue, I'm going to go ahead and draw a few things. So I'll come over here to my line tool. And I'm actually going to change my color to be red as I draw this, so hopefully you can see it a little bit better. And I may also need to up the, the, the stroke weight of this so you guys can see it a little bit better. I'm not overly worried about it for you because you'll be able to see a thinner stroke when you do it, but for, for the projector, I want that to be a little bit bigger. So I'll start first drawing a diagonal from one corner to the other corner, like that. Relatively easy. Then I'll go ahead and I'll draw a diagonal from this corner across to that corner. So I've created a basic x. I then want to draw a line that goes from this corner across and meets at the center over here. So in order to do that, I'll drag a guide down to the center. And then I'll draw my line. Again, I'm with line across to where it meets right there. And I could, I could do the same thing on the bottom half. I'm not so overly worried about the bottom half just yet. Okay, So now that I have that extra little piece there, I'm going to start to establish a few things. First thing is I want my active content area to be proportionate to the page size. 
And I can do that relatively easily now that I have these diagonals set up. So I'll go ahead and I'll drag a line down and start this somewhat below where the page starts. So maybe an inch down from where the top of the page is, maybe 3 quarters of an inch, something like that. By the way, if I hold down Shift on the keyboard, I will cause my guide to jump in increments on the ruler. So in this case, we're every eighth of an inch. So I can actually jump and say, oh, I want it to be 3 quarters of an inch there. Maybe I want it to be 7 eighths of an inch or, or in fact, an inch. There it is. OK, so I have that guide there. I'm going to drag a line over to where it meets and intersects with that diagonal. So I've now created that corner edge. Wherever it intersects with the rest of the X, I'll go ahead and draw a line. Go to right there. And we'll go down here to right there. So what I've done here is I've established some margins around the outside of my page, and I've given myself an active content area. Okay, So all of my content is going to go in there. I have margins around the outside. I can then drag down a line to where those two intersect. And that divides this upper piece from the lower piece. If I don't like this position, if I feel like it's too big or too much content for what I'm drawing, I can also choose to split the difference between this and this. I can draw a line halfway there, and I can use that. It's really it's a matter of choice. So I'm using this to kind of establish the layout. So let me show you how I can put content in. So remember, this is a poster about the architecture um, program. So let's start with a little bit of text. So I'll use my text tool. And I'm going to create my text in this upper section of the page here. And so let me start on the, the left side here. And we'll make a little bit of text, maybe something like that. And I'll say this is DVC, DVC architecture program. I don't like this font, so I'm going to change that. Let's do maybe uh, Arial so it's a little bit cleaner. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Let's go to bold. Let's make the size get a little bit bigger. Too big. And you know what? I kind of want this architecture program to be in small caps. So let me come over here and choose my small caps right there. And I'll choose my small caps there. Make this a little bit longer. We'll go ahead and fill that out. All right, pretty good. Let's up that size just a little bit. Maybe about like that. So I've got that piece of text. It's, it's falling in this upper little content area. Um, let's go ahead and add a little bit more to it. Put another piece of text below it, and we'll say this is spring. Oops. I'll do it over here, and then I'll move it in. Spring. Sorry, it's not spring. It's fall of 2017. And again, I'm working with Arial as my font. I want this to be in small caps. And I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. So the first one that I did here, that font is at 17. This one, I'm working through my proportions. We'll do it at 10. I'll make this text box a little bit smaller. We'll put those two pieces together. <coughs> and I'm going to move them down so they're just above this line, which is ultimately going to be my flow line. I just selected one, held down Shift, and selected the other. And then I can move them together. So now I want to go ahead and start to put some content in this lower section of my uh, layout. So I could, of course, use one big image and fill up that space. But let's say that instead I want four smaller images. So let me go ahead and create an image. And uh, what do I have here? Uh, one, two, three and a half. So this is going to be about an inch and a half or so. 
Um, if I want a specific size rectangle, I pick the frame, I make a single click, and I can say 1.5 inches and 1.5 inches. I'll say OK. That gives me a, this little square. I'm going to move it up there. I'm going to go ahead and copy it. And then I'll go ahead and paste it again. Gives me the other size, like that. These are not big enough. So let's go, that was an inch and a half. Should have been a 1.75. There we go. Get rid of these first two. One, control C, control V to copy and paste. And I'll move this other one to right there. Like that. So I have those two pieces. I'll take these and I'll copy them. Control C, Control V. And I'll go ahead and set up another set down here. And we'll work with those four for right now. Now, notice, let me go ahead and I'm going to change. Sorry, I, made, I did actually just make a mistake. All of this content right now is on the non-printing layer. So if I wanted it to show up, I need it to be on my regular layer. And I made a mistake. I should have selected that first. So in, the, in, in InDesign and in Illustrator, if you have objects that are on an incorrect layer, if you select those objects, they're represented by a square next to the layer name right there. I can move those objects onto the other layer by dragging this square down to the layer that I want it to go on. And you can see that the, the shapes change color. They change the blue color because they're now on layer two. I can then switch under view. I can go to display performance and I can go, oh, sorry, I can go to screen mode and I can go to preview, which is going to show me just the stuff that is printing. And I can then work with these pieces to go ahead and place some images onto those pieces. So let's go back, view, I'll go to normal. And maybe, maybe the other strategy is to turn the, the grids off because at some point you need to turn those off as you keep, keep working with them. So notice, though, the space between here and here is different than the space between here and here. I might want to make adjustments to that. And in order to do that, I can use something called the Align tool. And they're available. If they're not available in on the right here, you can go to Window and then choose Objects and Layout and then Align. It brings up this little floating window that will allow us to line objects. So if, for example, I didn't have these quite set up correctly. Now, InDesign's made some improvements. When I drag this object over, it has some auto guides that will help me line these things up and make my life much easier. But if I didn't use those, I can select two objects. So I'll take this object and this object. And before I use the align tools, I need to specify which object stays the same. So which object isn't going to move. It's called the key object. So this object here isn't going to move. So I click one more time. So I've held down Shift. I click two objects. Then I click one more time on the object that's not going to go anywhere. That's the key object. Then I can use these align objects to say, oh, align them to the left so that they're in the same alignment here. I can also come down here to distribute spacing. And I can say, oh, I want to distribute the spacing to a specific value. So maybe uh, I want it to be uh, an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. I can then click on the distribute spacing, and it will do it at an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. So I can, for example, say this and this. This is my key object. Distribute the spacing to a sixteenth of an inch. This and this. Sorry. This. And this, that's my key object. Distribute the spacing there. This and this. Now distribute the spacing even to right there. The other thing that you can do, let me go back to this, where I have this. Let's take a few more. Let me copy and paste. And I'll throw one down here at the bottom. And I'll throw another one down here at the bottom right there. I want this object to end up in between this object and that object. 
So let me take all three of these, one, two, and three. And in this case, I can distribute the objects along their centers so that this one fits in between that and that with the same spacing on either side. So it's just a different strategy. If you don't see the align, go to View, or excuse me, Window, Object and Layout, Align. So that allows us to distribute the spacing. So for example, I could take these three objects now, one, two, and three, distribute the spacing between the objects, like that. And let's go ahead and use this as a key object and align to the left. So you see how I'm starting to use those to help myself out. Now in this case, I'd really like these to be a little bit more consistent in spacing. So I'm going to go ahead and add some spacing in between these objects so that they're a little bit better. So let's take this and this. I'm going to use a spacing of 0.125 or an eighth of an inch. Oops, that's my key object. And you know what, let me go ahead and do all three of these at once. key object, oops, I have to do them separately there, key object, distribute the spacing, <coughs> and we'll distribute the spacing there. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and, and pull these up just a little bit. So my, my overall layout is adapting and changing based on the content that I'm putting in. So don't be afraid to make some uh, adjustments. So in this case, I needed to move that up a little bit. So now I can place the images into these spaces. Oh, you know what? Let me. Let me go ahead and make the spacing across be the same too. So we'll add that spacing so that they're consistent. Like that. This again doesn't really matter that they're the same. So now all of these are the same. So I can go ahead and I can place in my photographs. So I'll select each one and I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll drop in a particular image, Fitting. Fill frame proportionally. I'll move on to the next one, file, and then place. I'm tired of using those images. Do I have new ones here? Yeah, let me drop in some other ones. Fitting, fill frame proportionally. OK, so you're getting the idea. So I'm dropping these in. So obviously, these fit nicely in my grid modules. There, 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 there. Now, sometimes we want to span multiple grid modules. So I have a couple options. Number one, I could say, you know what, instead of this particular piece, I'll get rid of that, and I'll take this frame, and we'll just move it over so it spans multiple modules. That's pretty easy. We we'll go to File, and then Place, and we drop a particular image in, fill frame proportionally, and there it is. But sometimes I want to maintain the grid-like structure, but have an image span both of these. And I can do that by clicking on the first one, holding down Shift, and clicking on the second one. And then I'm going to go up to Object, Compound pa Object, Paths, Make Compound Path. Sorry, you can do Control-8, too. So it's Objects, Paths, Make Compound Path. And notice that the X changes from one side, or two, f sorry, from two Xs to one big X that spans across them. Now when I go to File and then Place, and I drop a particular image in, the image goes across both pieces. Let me right click and go to Fitting, Fill Frame Proportionally. But I still have two separate grid modules. See how that works? Okay, So I have a lot of flexibility in terms of how these pieces start to play out long term. So I can look at this as a preview. I can go into my view, and I can go to screen mode, and I can say, show me in preview. And we can start to see what I've set up so far. That's starting to lay this out. In this case, I don't really have any text, so I could convert one of these objects into text. When I have 
a photograph or a frame, I can also convert that frame. Let me draw a new one here. Actually, let me create a new page so I can keep working on this here. I have a frame. I can convert that frame into text by using the text tool and then clicking inside of the frame. So even if I created it as a frame and it has an X in it, it can become a text box. But the other thing that can happen, and I told you I would start to talk to you through this, is I can use an alternative grid to set up a particular swath of content. So let's say, for example, I wanted to do one of those strong diagonal compositions. I could, using either the pen tool or I could use one of the shape tools, so I could use a polygon or an ellipse. For me, the pen tool is probably the most logical here. I'll click on the pen tool and I'm going to draw the diagonals that I want. So I'll start here and I'll draw a diagonal that goes down, goes right to there. I'm going to come across straight. I'm going to come back up. And I'll come over to that. So I have that shape. I'll create the opposite shape that goes down here. And I'm just, oops, sorry, that should have finished. I wasn't, wasn't quite on top of my shape. There we go. Create the opposite shape. We'll go there. We'll come down here. We'll go to there. And I'll do one more little piece here. I'm doing this so that you guys can see me work through multiples here. And if you end up being a little uncomfortable with the pen tool, it's OK. We're going to spend a lot more time in Illustrator drawing with the uh, pen tool so you'll become very comfortable. So I have these three shapes, and I want to use these as if they were frames. Well, number one, I don't really want there to be the red lines anymore. So I can take one of these shapes, and I can make the red stroke go away by clicking on this icon here. So the stroke is highlighted there. There's a red color here. If I click and hold on it, we can say apply none, and that'll make the stroke go away. I can use that shape to place an image. So I can go to File and then Place with it selected. And I can choose a particular image. I'll right click. I'll go to Fitting. And I can say Fill Frame Proportionally. There it is. And you can see that part of the image. Now in this case, the image, I'm not seeing a whole lot out of it. And this is not necessarily the best layout. I'm just trying to show you how you could go about doing this. But I could also, just like I did with let me go back one more time here. So I'm here. Even though this isn't a frame, I could do the same technique where I could have an image span both of these pieces. So I could hold down Shift, select these two triangles, and I could say Object, sorry, Paths, Make Compound Path. Essentially, what Make Compound Path does is it makes two objects one object. Once that's done, I can go to File and then Place. And I could have my image span both of those. So let me go to Fitting, Fill Frame Proportionally. And now the image is spanning both of those. Notice the red is still there. So I have to select this and say Apply None to my stroke to make that go away and have just those images. I could then place in text or type in text in this particular piece. So I could go to File and then Place. And for lack of something better, I'm just going to go get that Vitruvius text from last class and drop that in. That's fine. Change all. And I could drop that into there as well. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Maybe 10 point. And now that's like that. If I don't want the border, control A to select all the text. I can say make the border go away. And now I have just that element there. So you can see how essentially I could create absolutely anything that I want or any shape that I want 
using the pen tool or any of the combination of the rectangle or predefined shapes. So there's an ellipse, there's a polygon, etc. So if I did an ellipse, I could then say, let's place the text in there. And that would show up inside the circle. Okay. I could also, instead, I could place an image inside that. So I could go to File and then Place. And I could drop an image into that instead. Oops. Sorry. Fitting. Fill frame proportionally, like that. If I wanted, and this is where I'm starting to just show you different things, because different people are going to have different ideas. Let's say that I had some text, and I wanted to place an image into some text. Let's start with DVC. Oops. DVC. I didn't understand it. It's OK. Uh, let's say, make that a little bit bigger. Let's go a little bit bigger still. OK, so I have some text that says DVC. Let's say I wanted to put an image in that text. I could take the text, and this is not a reversible process when I do this. I can go into Type, and I can choose Create Outlines, which converts the text into actual objects. And I could then go to File and then Place. And I could drop an image, fill frame proportionally, into where the text would be. So that works just like any other shape. So there's a lot of flexibility in the kinds of things that you can choose to do uh, as you start to play with it. Right, so first thing I do is I create the type. So. There's DVC. Let's see if I can. I'm going to change the font so that you guys can see it a little bit better. Let's go to maybe 150, like that. Okay, so I have the the font the way I want it. It looks the way I want it. I go up to Type and I say Create Outlines, which makes actual objects out of this text. I can't go back then with the text tool and change it. It's permanent. I can then go to File and then Place. And I could drop a particular image into where that text is. So let me go to Fitting and Fill Frame Proportionally. And you can see that happen. So there's a lot of flexibility in the kinds of things that you can do and, and, and to set up. And so I like to throw these kinds of things at you to get your brains thinking. Remember, today is not about creating the best design possible. It's about experimenting and trying different things. So you saw, as I was working through it, I ended up creating a lot of different pages. If you end up creating a bunch of pages with a bunch of different sample designs, that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll do more layout work next class when we, when we go into portfolios and I talk through portfolios. But this is kind of your first real iteration into complexity in, in the kinds of things that you're creating. Yeah? Absolutely. Either orientation is just fine. Any other questions? No? Exactly. Any, any, any of these techniques is fine. There isn't a right or a wrong thing. And it's not like today you have to do everything that I told you. I'm just trying to give you different things because people have different ideas. You can use any pictures you want. 